Good afternoon. Uh, Derry Exnet is proud to present today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Peter Hansen from University of Florida is going to be speaking with us on an, uh, an overview of genomic selection and fertility. Today, Dr. Hansen joins us to discuss this genomic selection as it relates to fertility traits. You'll learn about single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, the challenges in selecting reproductive traits, and some of the current work in overcoming those challenges. I want to draw your attention to the fact that today's session will be recorded and archived at our Dairy Xnut website that's shown here at the bottom of this page. I also would like to invite you to see our updates on webinars, new articles, and other great dairy resources. You can follow us on Facebook, sign up for our newsletter, or follow us on Twitter. So we're happy to have you with us today. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the day. Dr. Peter Hansen is a distinguished professor and L.E. Red Larson, professor of animal sciences in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. His research interests center around development of methods to improve fertility. Dr. Hansen joined the faculty at Florida as an assistant professor in 1984. His formal education was at the University of Illinois and University of Wisconsin. He is past president of the American Society for Reproductive Immunology and past vice president of the International Embryo Transfer Society. We're very happy to have Dr. Hansen with us today. I'm sure many of you recognize his name as an expert uh, around the world in reproductive physiology. At this point, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Hansen. Hey, thank you, Bob. I also want to thank Jean Wiebke and Nancy McGill for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about one of two major grants the USDA has funded to help solve one of the more vexing problems in dairy cattle management, namely getting cows pregnant. In large part, the problem of dairy cow infertility is a genetic problem. As we have selected cows for milk yield over the last 40 years, we have also selected cows that are genetically less able to establish pregnancy. And this concept is illustrated in this slide, which shows the historical changes in genetic merit for milk yield from 1957 until 2011, and the corresponding changes in daughter pregnancy rate during that same time period. Daughter pregnancy rate, which I'll talk about more in a little bit, is the most commonly used measurement of a cow's genetic ability for milk yield in the United States. As you can see in this slide, milk yield has increased greatly over the last 40 or 50 years, but at the same time, as the increase in milk yield was occurring, daughter pregnancy rate and other measures of fertility declined to a nadir around 2002. Recently, we've begun to see an increase in cow's genetic merit for fertility as dairy geneticists realized there was a problem and started incorporating measurements of fertility in net merit index. Nonetheless, as you can see in this slide, we have a long way to go before dairy cow fertility is restored to a level seen uh, in, the, in the 1950s and the 1960s. Animal breeding has changed a lot in the last few years. For most of the time, dairy cattle have been uh, selected genetically using scientific principles. We've measured actual performance of cows and use that information to estimate the genetic merit of their sires. All of that changed in 2009 with the advent of genomic tools for uh, selection of uh, traits important to the dairy industry. So today, we no longer measure the phenotype, how much milk a cow produces or how fertile a cow is, but directly look at the genes that that cow inherited that controls how much milk she produces or controls how fertile she is. So this 
approach called genomics depends on being able to identify specific mutations in genes that are responsible for variation in performance among cows or in genetic markers very close to those genes. So before I talk about this project that's being funded by the USDA to increase our ability to select cows genetically for fertility, let me just give you a little refresher course in Genetics 101. And in particular, I want to define what is a gene, what is a mutation in a gene, and what are the particular kinds of mutations called SNPs. The easiest way to think about genes are they are the blueprints that tell cells how to make individual proteins in the body. And of course, proteins are the workhorse molecules of the body. They're the molecules that make up muscle. They're the molecules that act as enzymes that control all the chemical processes in the body. They signal or communicate from one cell to another cell. So they're very important molecules in any animal's body. And proteins are made because of directions the cell receives from individual genes. And each gene is responsible for ensuring that the protein it codes for is made correctly. In cattle, like humans, there's about 20,000 specific genes that are responsible for the synthesis of protein. So it's quite a complicated process. So let me give you one example of a gene and how a single mutation in that gene affects the function of an animal. So a mutation is the change in the blueprint of the gene that uh, results in the difference in the way the protein is synthesized. One of the most dramatic uh, mutations that exists in cattle is the double muscled mutation. Cattle with a double muscled mutation have excessive muscle growth that appears at times like the cows have double the number of muscles. They don't, just the muscles grow larger than they're designed to do. And this, mute, this phenotype is caused by an error in one gene that's called myostatin. Myostatin is Latin. Myo means muscle. Statin means inhibitor. And in fact, myostatin causes a protein to be synthesized that during fetal life limits the growth of muscles. So when a mutation occurs in myostatin, the protein synthesized in response to that gene doesn't function quite right and muscle growth is greater than it should be. So this kind of mutation is called a single nucleotide polymorphism. There's just a single change in one base in this gene. This gene might have 100,000 bases. One of those bases is changed as compared to the default level. Just like if you took a blueprint, instead of making um, peers four feet apart, you made two of the peers three and a half feet apart. This single mutation can cause a dramatic change in the function of the protein. So, for example, here is a schematic representation of a chromosome of the cow showing individual genes where each gene is encoding for a specific protein. So the myostatin gene, for example, causes the myostatin protein to be synthesized in a certain way, and that protein functions during fetal life to keep the fetus's muscles from growing out of control. If a mutation, a specific mutation, occurs in that myostatin gene, the normal pattern of muscle formation is disrupted 
And that occurs because that mutation, shown here by the green circle, causes myostatin to be synthesized slightly differently than it ordinarily is. You see this little bump at the end? It's not present in this version of myostatin. As a result, the protein's not able to function correctly, and the animal experiences excessive muscle growth. So this myostatin is an example of a single nucleotide polymorphism, a single change in the blueprint of myostatin that causes a change in the phenotype of the animal. Well, of co course, most genetically controlled traits are not controlled by one gene but rather by variation in dozens or even hundreds of genes. That's probably the case for reproduction. Whether a cow is fertile or infertile probably depends on mutations in hundreds or maybe even thousands of genes. And so the job of the modern geneticist is to find these mutations or to find the markers close to these mutations that can predict whether or not a cow's got a good version of the gene, shown in yellow, or a bad version of the gene, shown in green. So, in dairy cattle, the most common genetic trait to estimate an animal's ability to uh, easily get pregnant is daughter pregnancy rate. It's not a particularly great trait, but it has the advantage that it's measured on most cows in the United States that are on Dairy Herd Improvement Association recording system. Daughter pregnancy rate is the percent of a bull's daughters that are eligible to become pregnant in a 21-day period, the length of the estrus cycle, uh, that actually become pregnant. So if you had 100 cows that are eligible to get pregnant during this 100 21-day period, and 15 got pregnant, the daughter pregnancy rate would be 15%. The national average for pregnancy rate is not very good, only about 16%. And in fact, the way daughter pregnancy rate is calculated is not directly by counting up the number of daughters and how many got pregnant, but rather indirectly from days open. You know, how long it takes a cow to get pregnant after it calves. Does it take 100 days? Does it take 120 days, et cetera? And from that number, daughter pregnancy rate is calculated. So basically, a 1% increase in daughter pregnancy rate is associated with a decrease in four days open. So if you went from a pregnancy rate of 16% to 17%, days open would decrease about four days. So this is an economically important trait. Obviously, the economic importance depends upon milk price and other factors, but roughly a 1% change in pregnancy rate has about the same economic impact as a 400-pound change in 305-day milk. And this photograph here is of a particular bull, Super Petroni, who actually has a very high daughter pregnancy rate. So his daughters, on average, have a pregnancy rate 3.7% higher than uh, contemporary herd mates. Well, daughter pregnancy rate is not a great way to measure a cow's ability to get pregnant because there's lots of specific things that ha have to happen to a cow from the time it calves until the time it gets bred, and then whether or not the cow is actually able to establish pregnancy after breeding. So, for example, the degree of uterine contamination with bacteria at calving affects whether or not the cow gets pregnant soon or not soon. The metabolism of the cow associated with milk yield, and in particular, there's hormonal changes associated with lactation 
that can affect reproductive function. The body weight changes that a cow undergoes after calving can affect whether or not it gets pregnant right away or it takes a long time. So there's dozens, maybe hundreds of physiological events that have to take place for a cow to get pregnant soon after calving. And the net result of that is that daughter pregnancy rate is not a great measurement of a cow's fertility. It's much less accurate than, say, milk yield is an estimate of a cow's ability to produce milk. And it also is characterized by low heritability. In other words, most of the variation between cows in fertility is not due to genetics. It's due to other factors. Also, because there's so many different traits, so many different physiological events that have to take place for the cow to get pregnant, means there's many, many different genes that are involved in controlling fertility. And that makes genomics, where we're trying to identify the individual genes responsible, uh, fairly difficult. So if we look at genetic control of reproduction, one of the things I think you learn in Animal Science 101, if you go to college, is the heritability of reproduction is low. Most of the genetic, most of the variation in reproduction is not due to genetics, it's due to the environment. So for example, the heritability at days open is only 0.04. 96% of the variation in, uh, for days open among dairy cows is due to differences in the environment. So what does that mean? It means there's lots of variation in reproduction due to the environment. It means that identifying genetically superior animals is going to be slow because most of the animals that are superior are not superior because of genetics. They're superior because they're in a better environment. However, the fact that heritability is so low does not mean that it's futile to select for reproduction. In fact, even with the tools we have now, you can make a lot of progress improving the genetics of a herd by selecting for fertility. These are some data we collected as part of our USDA project where we just evaluated what was the pregnancy rate at first service, what was the services for conception, and what were the days open in first lactation, second lactation, and third lactation for cows that are high daughter pregnancy rate cows. In other words, they have a high estimate of genetic ability for fertility versus cows that have a low estimated daughter pregnancy rate. So even though our accuracy is not good right now, you can see there's a big difference in pregnancy rate between those animals that are on one end of the daughter pregnancy rate scale and those cows that are on the other end of the daughter pregnancy rate scale. So right now, you can improve the fertility of a herd by selecting sires that have high DPR and the fact that we have data like this creates a lot of optimism that we can develop genomic tools to improve the rate at um, which um, fertility is improved. There's a problem with selecting for fertility, though, and that is that there's a negative genetic correlation between fertility and milk production. Some of this is because when cows get pregnant, their milk yield goes down. But as you can see, the correlation of daughter pregnancy rate with milk yield is negative 0.45. If we just selected for fertility, we'd accidentally select against milk yield. So what that means is that on the cow's chromosomes, there's some genes where the good version of the gene increases milk yield and the bad version decreases milk yield. There's some genes that control fertility. And then there's some genes that do both things. They affect milk yield and they affect fertility, but in different ways. The good version for milk yield is the bad version for fertility. So one goal of genomics 
is to be able to identify these genes that are good for fertility and these genes that are good for milk yield, but where there's not this negative correlation uh, between the two. So here's an example, you've seen him before, Super Patron, of a bull that has that kind of collection of genes. I told you before that this bull is a very good bull for daughter pregnancy rate. His daughter pregnancy rate is about 3.7. So on average, his daughters have a 15 days shorter days open than contemporary herd mates. But notice this bull is also positive for milk yield. So even though there's this negative genetic correlation between milk yield and fertility, bulls like Super Patron exist that have the right combination of genes so you can improve milk yield and improve days open. So a bull like Patron presumably has large numbers of these genes, good milk yield genes, good fertility genes, but not too many of these genes where an increase in milk yields associated with a decrease in fertility. So the last point I'll make, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this grant that we're doing. There's four obstacles we have to get the best results possible using genetic or genomic selection for reproduction. The reproductive traits that are usually measured on dairy cows, like daughter pregnancy rate, are not very accurate. The heritability is low, so we're not all that good at identifying genetically superior bulls. There's this negative correlation between genetic ability for reproduction and genetic ability for production. And for genomics, we have this problem that there's lots of genes that affect reproductive traits. And effects of one gene might actually depend upon what version of another gene you had. And so that makes the problem more difficult for uh, the geneticists trying to improve estimates of which cows are fertile and which cows are not fertile. So how do we get around that? Well, first of all, we have to find the genetic mutations, the SNPs, and some other kind of mutation I'll tell you about in a minute that control reproduction. And this can be done two ways, using the traits we already use, like daughter pregnancy rate, and then also using other estimates of reproductive function that are not routinely measured, like whether or not a cow gets metritis after calving. And the goal should be to find the genetic mutations in the actual genes that control reproduction, as well as to parts of the DNA that are physically close to genes that control reproduction. Because of the nature of how genes are inherited, markers that are physically close to the genes causing a change in phenotype can predict these genes. We also need to find how genes interact with each other you know, networks of genes. Maybe one gene by itself doesn't have much effect, but if five or six or ten other genes are also having the optimal mutations, we can get a synergistic improvement in fertility. So one goal of our grant is to try to identify these networks. And lastly, I've been talking about SNPs, which are single changes in the blueprint of a given gene. What I didn't tell you about is during evolution, some genes get copied. So instead of having one copy of the gene in the, on the chromosome, there might be two or three or four. And those genes may end up doing the same thing or different things over time. And so there's interest in this grant that we're funded on from the USDA to try to identify genes where more than one version of the gene exists so we can see whether or not the number of copies of the gene is related to fertility. And of course, another goal is to find genes related to reproduction that are not negative for production. In fact, there might actually be some positive to production. 
So, in other words, we want to find the actual mutation in genes that affect fertility. We want to find markers, changes in the gene very close to the actual mutation that predict that mutation. We want to find genes that are good for reproduction but not bad for milk yield. And we want to find how genes interact with each other, whether or not how a cow inherits a mutation at this gene affects the function of this gene. So that's the goal of our grant led by Tom Spencer at the University of Missouri and another grant led by Pablo Pineda at Texas A&M. I should mention we're also interested in copy number variants, whether some genes exist in multiple copies and whether or not those variants affect uh, reproductive function. So our goal of the grant is twofold. First, to develop novel genetic markers of fertility using both heifer fertility and lactating cow fertility as endpoints, and then find the specific genetic mutations that affect fertility, daughter pregnancy rate, embryonic development, and understand how these genes network with each other to affect cow fertility. A related goal is to uh, provide this information to the user, to the dairy farmer and allied dairy industry so that we can increase our ability to uh, use the genetic tools that are available and that are being uh, improved as a result of this grant so that we can more effectively increase fertility in cows without uh, decreasing milk yield. So there's really um, one overall objective of the research, and that's to identify novel genetic markers of fertility in replacement heifers and lactating cows. And these are the team of people that are involved in doing that project. There's several major thrusts behind this research, but I'm only going to go over briefly a couple of them. One led by Tom Spencer, Holly Nieberg, and um, Joe Dalton on heifer fertility, and another one led by me and John Cole on dairy cow fertility. So in the first experiment, the Spencer, or I should say the Missouri University of Idaho, Washington State group is looking at heifer fertility, which is something usually not measured very carefully in cattle, and using this information to identify uh, mutations that are associated with fertility. So what the uh, Missouri, Washington State, Idaho group is doing is classifying heifers as to whether or not they get pregnant the first time they're bred or uh, are pregnant after the fourth or more breedings or never get pregnant and get culled, and then using this information to try to find mutations associated with um, fertility. So here's some of their results. This probably looks very confusing. What this is is an estimate of how much specific mutations explain variation in whether heifers are classified as fertile or infertile at 50,000 different locations in the bovine genome. So each of these lines represents an individual chromosome. So you can see most of these locations on the chromosomes don't really explain much variation in whether heifers are, have an easy or hard time getting pregnant. But you can see that there's specific spots, like for example on chromosome 4, that explains a lot of the variation in heifer fertility. Here's another one on chromosome 10 and a couple more on chromosome 10. So what we're doing is using this information to try to more finely identify these genetic markers 
so they could be incorporated into tests available to the producer when um, trying to identify genetically superior animals for fertility. We're also doing this using lactating cows where instead of trying to use these uh, broad-based SNP chips, which have 50,777,000 ,000 individual markers on them, we're looking at known mutations in genes that control fertility to see which of these explain the most genetic variation in fertility. So in particular, we've used a population of 550 bulls that are either high daughter pregnancy rate bulls or low daughter pregnancy rate bulls and found 40 individual mutations that are associated with daughter pregnancy rate. And the interesting thing about these mutations is that most of these mutations are not associated with milk yield so that you could select for the optimal mutation for these genes without decreasing fertility. So these genes have now been incorporated into the Dairy uh, Cattle Breeding Council's um, gen genomic estimates of fertility. So in the upcoming months, when bulls and cows are estimated genomically, for uh, genetic ability for reproduction, it will include these SNPs. So the accuracy of estimates of who's fertile and who's not fertile genetically will be improved. There's a couple other major objectives of this grant that I'm not going to go into because uh, I can see I'm running out of time. Another important objective of this grant, which is being led by Albert DeVries, at uh, University of Florida is to evaluate how to use these genomic tools that we're developing in conjunction with a lot of reproductive management tools like sex semen, in vitro fertilization, et cetera, in a way that will allow us to maximize the improvement in profitability through genetic selection. Who should get genotype? What kind of selection criteria should be used? What kind of uh, selection intensity should be performed? Should we use sex semen? Should we use embryo transfer? These are the kind of questions that we're beginning to evaluate, and we will provide that information uh, to the producers and allied industry personnel as those data become available. So our fourth objective, you're kind of seeing one example of it right now by listening to me, is to transfer this information uh, to dairy producers, managers, and allied industry personnel. Once we identify new tools for improving the genetic accuracy, for selection for reproduction, and once we uh, use um, computer modeling and business modeling software to develop uh, good guidelines for how genomic information should be used in conjunction with different reproductive technologies. We want to get that information out to the people who can use it, the dairy producers and managers and allied industry personnel so that we can most effectively use this new tool of genomics uh, to improve uh, reproductive outcomes in dairy cattle. And of course, these same tools or similar types of tools will be used for other uh, genetically important traits as well. Lastly, I, I just want to point out that we've been giving workshops around the country on how to use genomics and, and dairy cattle uh, selection systems. Uh, more will be offered in the future. We're doing this around the country, so I encourage everybody to be on the lookout for these workshops. The expected outcomes are of the grant, I think I just said, better genomic tools, more reliable estimates of who's really genetically fertile and who's not, and the net result is more rapid progress in improving dairy cow fertility. We want to get these values back up
closer to what they were 20 or even 40 years ago. Uh, one group that I need to thank a lot because they've been really crucial to all of the uh, research uh, performed as part of this USDA grant are various uh, dairy producers in the western United States who are listed here in this slide, uh, working con in conjunction with uh, Washington State University and University of Idaho, and then also the work at uh, University of Florida actually involved uh, dairies uh, in the state of Florida, like Larson Dairy, as well as dairies in California. So uh, without the participation of uh, the dairy farmers around the country, a lot of this uh, that I talked about today wouldn't be possible. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, good luck getting your cows pregnant. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Pete Hansen for this very exciting presentation and overview of the project that they have underway. And I'm sure it's, it's going to result in some, some big impact on fertility of dairy cows in, in this country. We want to thank you very much for watching today. And we would really appreciate it if you would take a little bit of time to go a step further with us and Click the link that's shown on your screen to fill out a brief survey. This will help us not only to improve uh, future webinars, but also helps us to decide on, on new topics that people are interested in, in hearing about. So thank you very much for being with us today, and have a great day.